Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 55 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I am joined once again by my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. The Big Five Five. Uh, welcome, listeners. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I uh, don't know if that commemorates is, any particular... Is it particular really that big? Any... I don't know. It, it feels like... No, I know. I was going to say, I don't know if it really commemorates any sort of official anniversary, but, you know, it's a nice even number. It's, it's a nice round number. Well, so. it's, it's actually an odd number. It's an odd number. I know. Yes. But you, you know what I mean. It's uh, divisible by five, so I, I, I see that as something. So. Uh, not even. It is the opposite of even, so... <laughs> Uh, it, but regardless, it is one more episode that we get to do, and that's always a good thing. It's always a pleasure to share uh, the airwaves with you, Pervez. Yeah, always, always, uh, and uh, always ripe for some very interesting conversations. And uh, I think that uh, this particular one couldn't be more timely um, as it uh, is uh, in conjunction with the release of a very exciting new uh, feature film. That's right. Well, our guest for this episode is Lena Khan, and Lena is a writer and director. Her new film is The Tiger Hunter, and it, as you are listening to this, it is in theaters uh, right now. So uh, you want to check that out, and it's already gotten great write-ups in The Hollywood Reporter, in The New York Times, etc. Now, uh, Lena gained experience at companies like Participant Media, where she worked on films such as Syriana and The Kite Runner, before focusing on directing her own work. And she's directed commercials, films, and music videos for international artists such as Maher Zayn. And her videos have been broadcast on TV across the world and received over 30 million hits on YouTube. She graduated from UCLA, uh, the prestigious school of film, theater, and television, after which she spent years gaining experience at renowned film companies, and she recently sold her first TV show and is now working on another show, a movie, and a children's book. And as I said, The Tiger Hunter is the culmination of four years of, uh, of work, starting with a Kickstarter uh, funding campaign, which uh, that, that was the first time I got to talk to Lena, uh, what feels like many months ago. So the fact that we're here now to talk about the completed film in theaters is uh, very exciting for me. I feel like I, I have a, a little bit of thread in this amazing tapestry that she has woven. So thank you, Lena, for coming on Diffuse Congruence and talking about your story and about uh, The Tiger Hunter. Well, thanks for having me. You definitely were uh, a piece on the road there, so I was kind of excited to get on here before the release. Well, and we, we are very honored, yeah, to, 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 to have our platform be one of the venues, at least, uh, that you are able to not only talk about the film, but also we love to kind of talk about your origin story and kind of where it all began. I don't know, Zeki, if that's where you were going. Sorry. That, that is. Well, uh, no, nope, you, you just uh, finished my thoughts. So, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, well, that's th- what we do here. We finish each other's thoughts. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Lena, I mean, t- talk about the the road to the tiger hunter, and in that sense, I mean, your your journey in this area, which I mean, I, I don't need to tell you this; it is a non traditional field, certainly in in uh, the Muslim community. Uh, I, I studied film, and uh, that was uh, uh, that was a you know. Th- at the, at the time I went, that was not something that was traditionally accepted. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was any more accepted when you went, but I would love to hear your road through that process. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't get so much of people, like my parents didn't discourage that much. They just also didn't encourage, and they were sort of just waiting for this. Um, I think my dad, I mean, the way he talks would be like, okay, he's sort of waiting for the stupidity to pass. And I think it was only until recently where he sort of embraced and like, okay, I guess this is okay. Um, but otherwise, it was actually more from community members than my family or anything like that. Like sure. there was, um, uh, yeah, you know, aunties and uncles who were sort of like, you know, beta, like, when are you going to give up this, this, you know, and kind of get on the right path. You know, like maybe some, I mean, here here and there emails from, like, the Muslim community talking about how, like, you should only be doing documentaries. But aside from that, I mean, it it wasn't so much um, discouragement as, you know, lack of support, but, you know, they're not obliged to support anyway. So, you know, you just do what you got to do. So, so, I mean, I mean, talk about what, what it was about uh, this field that, that appealed to you. Uh, above and beyond. I mean, you know, we, we, we talked about this, you know, the last time I talked to you many years ago about this idea of separating, uh, Muslim stories from stories about Muslims. And that's something that, uh, certainly I feel like you, you accomplished that with the tiger hunter. Uh, was that something that was at the forefront of your thinking? 
Um, you know, I think fortunately before I had started on this movie, I kind of let it go of trying to have too much of an agenda behind sure. things. I mean, I got into the field because um, I like people. I mean, I like, I mean, whether it's through like trying to do good things or I just, I, I hang out a lot with my friends. I do interfaith things. I do like knowing people is something that's very important to me. And I just feel like the communities before I actually got to know them well, like, and I think I've said before, it's like, okay, I, to be honest, I did not have as many Jewish friends growing up, but I felt like I had some semblance of an idea about their community more than some others because of what I had seen on TV. Right. <laughs> and and you didn't, you don't really have that as much for, you know, Muslim community and things like that. And just feel, feels like people have um, stories, you know, funny or dramatic or struggles like, you know, Movies seem to be the way to know people and just seem like it'd be nice if people knew each other a little bit more. And so that's what attracted me to the field. Whether or not like it had to be Muslim stuff, I never actually thought I would do Muslim stuff. Hmm. I thought it, and, it, and this one came out for, you know, sort of organically. I was telling some stories about my dad at work and people just, they were cracking up at the sort of stories I was telling. And I, then I went down that path. I was like, okay, it started with stories about my dad and became something else. My grandfather was a tiger hunter. And he happened to be Muslim because, um, you know, my dad is Muslim, and that's what I knew. Um, there were some things in there that were purposeful, like Babu is Pakistani on purpose, because I, I always feel like it's dumb that Pakistanis have a bad rap when everybody loves Indians right now, and I'm like, I can barely tell them apart. But aside from that, yeah, no, I just wanted to, I, I was telling a story about a father and some son, a father and son and success, and I wasn't really thinking, like, is this a Muslim story? Is this a whatever? So, uh, yeah, I... I Oh, sorry, Zucky. Go ahead. I was just going to say I, I kind of appreciate that distinction. I, I and, you know, and Zucky, and, and you kind of called uh, on it in your question, but um, like that distinction between stories about Muslims versus Muslim stories, you know, and I, I, I really like that and appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I think that I've been on so many panels and things like that discussing all those things, but I think just people need to tell the stories that they feel strong about telling. And sometimes, yeah, those will be Muslim stories or stories about Muslims, and I think both are okay, and it doesn't have to be one or the other. We just have so many arguments about what one should be and what shouldn't be. I think we just need more of all of them now. I think that's the point I've got to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I take it not only from kind of what you mentioned about your father and his experiences and kind of you know using that as inspiration for um, some of uh, the some of what you capture in the Tiger Hunter. Um, I, I take it then that you're sort of like us here on our end, me and Zucky, you're born to immigrant parents who probably immigrated here in the 60s or 70s. Very much so. Yep. Exact same. <laughs> OK. OK. Uh, did you grow up on the East Coast, West Coast? Canada. So um, I grew oh, up sorry. On the West Coast yeah, in Rancho Another... I was born in Canada, I, but then I moved when I was little to Rancho Cucamonga, California, which is about an hour east of L.A. And nice. so of I grew up there. Wow. And so just proximity yeah, really, to L.A. Name for a city. <laughs> <laughs> it's about an hour from L.A. So, so just being near L.A. Uh, kind of uh, can't help but get, get it in your, your, your bloodstream a little bit, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when I was small, I mean, like, you know, my mom, she's always been sort of like an activist sort. Um, she's a doctor, though. But when, I remember when The Siege came out, and I forgot if it was Sony, but I think we went to Sony Studios and went and talked to them, like had a talking to with them, like the Muslim community. My mom took me when I was really little, probably under 10, talking about how, like, why do you guys keep making terrorist movies and things like that? So from, like, uh, you know, a pretty small age, we had, you know, involvement with all things Hollywood, you know? And then yeah. when I went to UCLA, it's like you walk into a coffee shop and you're bound to have like three screenwriters sitting there. And so, you know, it's in the air here. Yeah. I, I you know, it's funny you mentioned, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, like the siege, but I, I, for me, I, I remember growing up, it was the siege and I think executive decision that I remember kind of where the Muslim <laughs> community really as a, you know, a, a, as a collective, you know, was actively involved in kind of not only protesting the film per se, but really trying to have those conversations around how Muslims are portrayed in the media uh, or, in, or in major films. Although certainly those two were not the first in portraying Muslims in that negative light. But I just felt like as a community, you know, call it maturation or whatever, um, we, we sort of took on, we, we took on those two movies head head on you know but what's interesting about executive actually both of those films but executive decision i remember reading roger ebert's review and he mentions how there's a character in there who is you know one of the terrorists and he's like no this is wrong you shouldn't do this and then of course you know the character gets killed by the bad guy and ebert called that out in his review he's like this is the filmmakers covering their behinds 
And so in other words, right. he, he saw that for what it was. And, and then I guess in the siege, you have Tony Shalhoub's you have character. Tony Shalhoub's who, character, and so that who's so, supposed to be the quote unquote sympathetic mainstream Muslim or whatever that means. Well, right? I, I remember going to see the the press screening of the siege because this was I was I was uh, uh, the movie critic for the College of DuPage newspaper, and I went downtown and I watched I watched the siege with Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel and and uh, I think Roy Leonard was there, a couple of these other people, and so. That I specifically what you what you just mentioned I called that out in my review I was like the the fact that Tony Shalhoub's character is put in there is the filmmakers being able to give themselves plausible deniability and that and that's I, that's the the story of this genre you know I mean it's it's I think it says something about the industry that I don't think you could make a movie like The Siege today and have it be the same kind of movie I think I think. There has been progress in that sense, and I think that's worth acknowledging. That's true. I mean, there's definitely a lot of progress, but then there's, you still see a lot of the same things too. I mean, they have they do that thing where they're basically covering their butt all the times on all the time on TV. Yeah, <laughs> with a lot of like the sort of terrorist shows, and then you're like, oh, but let's have the good FBI agent. Homeland and that'll is, make everything is better. <laughs> especially guilty of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And plus, I but mean, there's yeah, yeah. there's uh, American okay. Assassin is in theaters right now, which is just, I mean, I, I was watching the whole movie with kind of like through my fingers. I was watching that movie. It was it was cringe inducing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Uh, well, you're not missing much. <laughs> Okay, well, good to know. Yeah. Uh, but but it, t- talking about your own inspirations, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, uh, we, we kind of went down this road. We're talking about uh, how films have depicted Muslims. But, I mean, you said that that wasn't, that wasn't at the forefront of your thoughts. So, so as a film buff growing up, who, who were, who were the, the storytellers who you gravitated towards? Um, so, like, there's movies that, you know, probably aren't my style yet, or at least right now, but I mean, the ones I was watching was, I had two older brothers. Mm -hmm. We're watching things like, um, I don't know, American Beauty, Fight Club, The Usual Suspects. I mean, those were high on the list of things. And then sort of classics, like, you know, I can watch Forrest Gump and The Shawshank Redemption five million times. Um, It wasn't until like later on where I kind of had, you know, different, I mean, like now you kind of my favorites, but they weren't growing up. Sort of like the Edgar Wrights, Danny Boyle, thing like that. Guys who are really like playful with what they're doing. Right. But growing up, it was just a bunch of uh, movies that my brothers picked, and um, now I love them. <laughs> so yeah, uh, pretty much anything that has yeah that uh, well, the fight yeah Fight Club. Yes. Oh, now I want to watch some of them. But yeah, it seems like those. Fight Fight Club uh, is my genre. Fight Club is a pretty formative movie for people who were like at the right age to be exposed to that when it came out. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it was just very. Um, there's something different about it where like you weren't playing by your usual studio conventions. It's like ah, we can get a little crazier with these movies, which is why I, I mentioned you know Danny Boyle and Edgar Wright and things like that because it felt like. I don't know. I guess it's just me. It felt like for me, those were sort of lines where like, no, we're going to push a different way. We're going to be a little bit more playful and we're going to do things a little bit more stylistically less conventional, which I thought was very cool. And it's something that I've always loved. And I mean, I think specifically uh, when you look at Danny Boyle and and uh, Fincher, I mean, they play within the studio playground. I mean, these these are in demand directors who, oh, for sure, yeah. Do, you know, not not to diminish Edgar Wright, but I mean, specifically Boyle and David Fincher have done big studio movies, and and they are they continue to to make those films. I mean, I, I think I think Edgar Wright has has you know, I mean, when you look at like Baby Driver, that's not a big blockbuster. Then I think th- that's a key to its success. But I think th- that's really fascinating in and of itself is that. There's that tendency of saying like, oh, if you're going to make studio movies, you have to sort of march to their drum. And I think that is true to some extent, but there's still room for these very unique voices. I mean, nobody's going to confuse a David Fincher movie with a movie by anybody else. Right. Yeah, that's true. And honestly, like just because I'm just starting to talk to studios about things now, I got repped after the Tiger Hunter. I feel like I'm learning about all these things, and so I, I, I feel like you'd know more about it. I'm, I'm sitting there wondering. I'm like, oh, I wonder, you know. But they do they take do studios take those chances on like younger directors, or is it like a David Fincher proves himself first, and now he can make a studio movie that's just crazy, and they'll trust him. Um, otherwise, like, there's a lot of those sort of like 
formulaic studio content. Like I read that stuff. My agents send me that stuff all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, I think those are the ones that are like the 90%. And then they just have trusted directors like these guys. And they're like, fine, you guys do whatever you like. But I feel like um, your experience outweighs mine and knowing that, about that stuff. Well, it's, it's, it's really interesting because what, what, what you tend to see, like we saw this earlier this year. I mean, Jordan Peele makes Get Out. And it's this massive hit on a micro budget. And what's the first thing they do is they're like, oh, come make, you know, Akira for us. So this, like, just in other words, get, get into our blockbuster box, you know? And it's like, right, yeah. like why, why are you doing that? You know, and, and now I think they're trying to get Taika Waititi to do that. And and that 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 movie is like the Flying Dutchman of studio blockbusters because they've been trying to make it forever. But that's the tendency is is you 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 see a lot of that individuality and uniqueness drained out, and very rarely does it poke through. Uh, and and I don't mean to sound like I'm down on studio movies because I'm not, but I mean. There is, you know, it just stands to reason that the bigger the investment that a studio is putting in, the less ability a, a director is going to have to be, you know, to to give it as as unique a voice as as they might want. Right. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, for me, I'm just sort of like experiencing it right now and kind of seeing how it plays out as I kind of wade into studio waters. And so, um, it's weird though to have so many bosses yeah right. <laughs> on an independent <laughs> film you don't have them now it's like every time there's a little decision you go through these 10 bosses who have to check everything and get back to you well i mean talking about making making a tiger hunter now going from the 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 kickstarter thing which is itself kind of new insofar as as getting movies made i mean it used to be you would just kind of roll the dice and hope somebody was willing to to take a chance on your script. And now to some extent, the, the, the filmmaker themselves can be in the driver's seat. So that's, that's new. And you kind of got in at the, at the early part of that idea of, of crowdfunded movies. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess so. Now there's so many different ways to go about it. Um, we just, I mean, actually before our Kickstarter, we just went to venture capitalists and things like that. Okay. So we had the bulk of the funds before we even did Kickstarter. So oh, we okay. had, um, we had a lot of the project in our hands. So, at at the time that you 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 made made it something where where people could kick in their funding, did you have the cast lined up, or was that something that you were like, once we have the funding in place, we'll 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 get get actors locked in? Yeah, it was definitely once we have the funding. Also, because we didn't know who we could afford, sure. and we didn't, you know, a lot like when you're dealing with a first-time filmmaker and things like that. A lot of these actors don't; their agents rather mm -hmm. won't really engage with you unless they know that this movie is going to happen, and it won't spend like ten years finding finishing funds and things like that. Right. Um, so, because yeah, because by the time we got the actors on board, you know, it was only two years until like release. Um, so yeah, no, we didn't have anything. The Kickstarter. Okay. People were just very gracious and supporting, even though we had literally no cast lined up. Yeah, mm. I mean that that's fascinating. In I mean because because when I look at other Kickstarter funded movies, you know, there's the the um, oh my gosh, what am I the the this the Garden State guy? What's his name? Zach Braff. Uh, Zach Braff. You know, he he had his he got his movie funded. Uh, there was the uh, the Veronica Mars movie. I mean, these were these were to some extent marquee names that k kick people in. And so, to me, the fact that here here's a movie where it's like here's a concept. This is what we're trying to get funding for. Uh, no big names attached yet, and yet people saw something in that premise. I mean, that's kind of remarkable. Yeah, it was pretty exciting because we, um, you know, obviously because, you know, the Muslim community was, was, some of it was trying to be supportive and I'm Muslim. We had, if I look at my Kickstarter, because I just emailed all my Kickstarter backers, mm -hmm. um, and we had about a little bit over a thousand because we got some from PayPal as well. And there, there's pretty much a, an even split-ish, you know, a little bit less Muslims, but 60-40 um, with a whole bunch of like, let's say, people who aren't Muslim. And for them, it was just cool because all sorts of people were like, hey, you know what, that really reminds me of my parents. Huh. And that's that's all. And for some reason, I guess people had enough nostalgia, and they wanted something, you know. I guess that was uh, reminded them of family in that way. And then for the Muslims, I don't think the project honestly mattered as much. Uh, for them, it was hmm. they were they were funding me. 
Um, and yeah. I appreciate it. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or bad thing. I wish I could say just like my project was so phenomenal that <laughs> it didn't matter who was doing it. But for the Muslims, they were just like, they, I, it seemed to me that they were like, okay, this feels like it's going to be a good project and we're rooting for her and we're going to believe in her. And I just am insanely grateful for that because, you know, obviously all the people who helped me in the movie made my career. Like I'm actually working now. I feel so grateful. And I always think like if these people didn't exist, like neither would I in this. Wow. Film. That's you know, amazing. It was because they gave me that start. Like, because your first movie is your calling card. Right. Right. Like they send it over and yeah. like all this press, I send it to my agents now and they like run with it. Like the right reason why I got into rooms, like you can't work in TV unless you have, like you can make an indie film. It's very hard to work in TV without having done something. You don't get in those rooms. And now like my agents, like we were pitching everywhere and the show we just sold, it was because of the movie. So it's like much thanks to everybody who had ever, ever helped me out. That's amazing. Uh, I was actually curious, kind of go, maybe maybe going back a little uh, in terms of the writing process, and just you 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 did mention again finding inspiration in your father's story, and again that experience alone being you know not unique to your father, but something that was shared across you know perhaps an entire generation or um, of uh, of children of immigrants. Um, but what you know. What went into the writing process beyond just sort of stories of your father and, you know, and, and things that he had, you know, that you had grown up listening to? Um, what was sort of your, you know, the intentionality behind, you know, like the story that you did come up with? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know what my writing process was at the time, but now I've done a few more things. I feel like now I know what it is that I do. And it's just a lot of, um, first it was a lot of sort of research because huh. I, I like to kind of find like what is the actual organic nature of a story like what's in there and so a lot of it was um i sat and i heard from hours i made my dad go through all the stories like of his life during that decade and then i went to my mom and then i went to my uncles and then i went to people in the community and then i found neighbors and whatever like all kinds of immigrants from all sorts of walks of life like i'd be hanging out in downtown la it was totally bad because i'm totally profiling and like just have conversations with people and then they sit down with me for like an hour and so a lot of the so a lot of the stories in the movie came from that but not just that like trying to figure out, like, what was, like, a, what was the heart sort of it? Like, what was the common denominator? And so um, the part that came, so the thing that I, I ended up ending up with was is the father-son story, which is a, a, a son trying to sort of glow, live up to the glory of his father. Um, and the other things came into play. But the interesting part was a lot of these people who immigrated had that similar feel. Um, a lot of them, it was like they're they're trying to fill the shoes of their parents or or live up to an expectation or something like that. And so, um, the writing process was then kind of like looking for like what is that through line going to be that is very real. Um, and and it, it was real because it came from all these sorts of people. And so that's sort of like what I like to run with. Yeah, and. I uh, sorry, uh, having just read like uh, you know and, and seen a little bit of the movie and, and you know and just seeing some of the synopsis and, and and things like that and the trailer certainly indicates this, but uh, other than that, like the, the the sort of stranger in a strange land or fish out of water kind of uh, experience for a lot of people who do immigrate here, um, you do tackle some I think other issues that are probably I mean that are maybe less universal and more specific to immigrants from. Pakistan or India or maybe other parts of the Muslim world even where, you know, you've got issues of like arranged marriages and, 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 and things like that as well. I mean, was that also kind of, again, part of that, you know, when, when you were when you were talking with the people that you did speak with and hearing their stories? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot. It was kind of hard honing everything down when I was writing because there's so much I wanted in there. And there's so many things going on. Like there's him trying to live up to his father. There's also the love story. There's, there's. I mean, the core of it really is a bunch of guys redefining their idea of success, which is what a lot of hmm. people battle with, not just like yeah. parents, but like people living in corporate America or really you have these ideas of what does it mean for you to have succeeded as a person and, and right. for you to ever have some semblance of happiness. You got to wrestle with that and decide how you're going to define that for yourself, which is what really everybody's doing. Um, in the movie. So, I mean, there was a lot of things. And, yeah, the arranged marriage thing because it was part of the time, and so it obviously came into play. And the immigration stuff because it, it ended, I mean, it wasn't going to be ignored. Like, I don't think that was my main focus, but it was an immigrant story. And so Babu's storyline with his visa and things like that, you know, even though it was small, um, became a little bit more prominent, too. I mean, now it's become very relevant, but at the time, but that one was intentionally put in. So there were some things that were just organic to, you know, the story and the time period and things like that, and some that were kind of like a little bit more, you know, I wanted it there. 
Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about working with Samir. We're pointing out Samir Gerdesi uh, uh, co-wrote the movie with you, and he's he's my cousin. I don't think I've I've mentioned on this show. I've had I've had him on my other podcast. Uh, what, at what point did he get involved, and and what was the back and forth like? Um, he got involved after I had already a draft or two, okay. and I thought, hey, this is my first movie, and I always wanted this movie to not just be. I'm not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just not my thing. Like to be you know, one of those sort of like $50,000 or something like shoot on your iPhone movies that is like a runaway success. And just, right. like I wanted to have a really high production value. I wanted it to be like, you know, a polished movie. And I was like, oh, let me get a professional writer on board. So I went and I used some seed money from a film festival and I hired him. He's a WGA writer. So, you know, like right. he has minimums. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's a polished guy. He's working on TV shows. Um, hired him, found him through his agent. I had no idea who he was. Um, and he was great. So we had a very professional relationship. It wasn't like two Muslims, like who happened to just be like writing on a couch. <laughs> right. And the industry is like a very, like I had, like I hired a writer and he was an absolute professional and he had a lot of great ideas. Like the entire thing with the car, the mm-hmm. general lead, that's, that's all Samir's contribution. Oh, how so funny. Some of the things that were really like, yeah. So now now that you say that, I'm like, him. yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, right. That's a, sort of him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and he 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 was a nice guy, and he was really like easy to collaborate with. And then he did, you know, more than he was sort of asked to do contractually. I mean, I don't. Hopefully, his agents won't hear this or whatever. But um, <laughs> in a, in a nice, gracious way. And then um, he did those, and then I I took the script back, and like over the next six, seven, eight, nine months or whatever, while we were doing other stuff, was always sort of doing revisions and. Mm-hmm. Um, New takes and things on it, but like I said, like a lot of the things he really established, generally the other stuff, like it's still in there. Well, I mean, with that in mind, I mean, uh, you mentioned a little bit as far as the casting. Obviously, Danny Danny Pudi, it's a, it's a it's a real showpiece role for him. Talk about uh, deciding that that he was the guy. Yeah, you know, at the beginning, like I said, it's like first movie. What do I do to get you know? Because I had my producer hat on at the same time as the director hat, which is like always hard. And so my my director hat is like whoever fits the role. My producer's hat is like you know for you to get a movie like this out there, you need a named star. And I was like, okay, South Asian land named stars. We got five people to choose from. <laughs> and so it was like chasing around all these people. Like we're like chasing these, like sneaking into the Indian Film Festival, and we got a hold of one guy. We got one other guy's Skype address. Um, and all kinds of things like that. And, and we actually got a couple of those interested. But then at the time when they were interested, we finally got a proper like producer and, ca- and casting director and all that stuff. So Emily Schwaber, who is um, an immense force in indie film casting, like she's one of like the two really respected people who like agents take her calls, um, put the script out there and Danny's agent responded. And I was like, Ovid, Ovid's weird. Um, <laughs> that was my first reaction. And then, um, you know, obviously I was like, okay, maybe. And so he showed up. In his vest on his Vespa, and then it was just made to be from there because you know Sammy also in my movie rides a scooter. Right. Um, but no, Danny's great. He just has such a, an amazing combination of heart and comedic timing. Like he can look at a ring and have soul. Um, and he was just so great to work with. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, I I was uh, I mean, this is the first time I've seen him in like a, a leading role, and he really uh, held my my attention. Which isn't to say he's never held my attention before, but I mean, you know, he's always been a really strong part of an ensemble. So having him be the focus of the story, uh, it was a very, it was a very pleasant surprise because I, I think he, he holds the screen magnificently. I mean, I love my actors, but there's something very special about Danny because he does exactly what an actor is supposed to do. Meaning hmm. he takes direction very well. Like he is very malleable. Like he can be one character, one minute. And I think if people gave him different roles, he could become it right away. Hmm. It's just, they sort of give him similar things, but he was just so, you know, he, he understood nuance so well and he understood exactly what you wanted. And he didn't just hold to like what he usually does. He just could totally adapt. And that's why he can go from Abbas to being this guy. And I think he could do like really whatever, honestly. So was was he the first person you locked in as far as the cast? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think we were getting Karen on board at the same time, but I'm pretty sure he was first. Okay. And then and then John Heater and, and Ken Pollock, everybody kinda of fell into place. John K yeah, pretty much the minute Danny came on board. Then we heard from John's agent. Oh, mm. great. 
Now, like your approach then as a director, uh, like how much input does the cast have and, you know, in sort of saying, well, you know, I, this is kind of what I see or what I see that this, you know, like the, the, that this character would do or say or respond to. I mean, I imagine, especially in the case of like um, Danny, like, I mean, you know, his own experiences, perhaps, you know, being also you know, born of immigrants and, and, and kind of maybe seeing it that way. Yeah, I mean, it was different with each actor. I mean, Danny, I mean, to his credit, like he would give advice and thoughts, you know, when he felt strongly, but he also very much was like, my job is sort of to trust your vision as a director, and so I'm not going to lead one thing, things one way because it might take a completely different tone than it was intended. Um, but, you know, he would give input when he felt like it was, it was important, and we took a, a lot of his notes. And there's, like, definitely a very collaborative process with all the actors. And some actors had been working on a lot more, like, comedy, for instance. And this was more like a grounded comedy. So sometimes they'd want to go a certain way, and we'd have to be like, no, that's not really where we're going. Um, but a lot of the time, it just end up because, you know, again, it was my first film, and, you know, a lot of them were more veteran people. It'd be like, okay, we'll do a take for you and a take for me. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. <sighs> So as I mean, this is this is your your first time doing a feature. Uh, I I always ask this whenever I interview a first time director. What what surprised you about the process? Because I mean, obviously you do all the prep, and and it's not like you're showing up completely cold. I mean, you have a clear sense, but you're still once you're once you're live, you're doing it. There's stuff happens that maybe you're like, oh, I didn't account for this is was there stuff about the process either either good or bad by the way not 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 meant to uh, go in one direction or the other so yeah it's funny because what i started learning by like a week into the production and i think now um i've gotten very comfortable with like problems coming because there's always going to be problems right and it feels like half the job of directors just to figure out like okay how are you going to deal with that um, problem without it like totally knocking you off your feet um and so it's just like okay well all right well so Karen can't come today, you know, whatever. Mm. Her agents are taking her away to be on Gallivant. Um, or we're right. going to have to block shoot this entire scene because half of the actors are going to be in Canada this day. Or, like, the General Lee just stopped working. Um, but huh. I think the thing that surprised was probably just, like, no matter how well, like, there was times when, like, very few times where, like, things were always changing, and so your pre-planning pretty much meant nothing. But it's like there were some parts where I, like, planned it to death, and I thought I had everything. And even then, there's just something that you didn't account for. And maybe that's just me being, you know, like, first-timer, right? I don't know if, like, somebody who's done their 10th film, like, they'll be, like, see these things coming. Like, even simple things. Maybe this is just me showing my greenness. And that was, like, for, like for instance, the suit-switching scene. Right, like I had everything mm -hmm. you planned for that, and there were some things we had to do really fast because we didn't have time. Right. But I didn't think of one very simple thing, which is these guys are all wearing one suit, but some of them are like pretty, some of them are are heavier, and some of them are ridiculously skinny. Like oh. Danny, how are they all going to wear one suit? <laughs> and so we ended up using it for comedy. You know, we're like, you know, Danny can't fit. Uh, Baba can't fit in the suit that's supposed to be Danny's and things like that. Uh, but otherwise, you know, that was almost a problem. <laughs> on set. I was like, man, I planned that one. Like, why didn't I think about it? So that's so and, stuff like that. It's and, like, man, whatever you do, you still can't win. And I mean, do you do you feel uh, an extra sense of of pressure of having to work through a problem right then, or you know, it's because because the the everyone is sort of expecting the director to have every problem figured out. So do you, do, especially given that this is, again, a, as, as a first-time feature, did, did that weigh on you, or is that not something that, that you had to worry about too much? Oh, no, it's for sure. Like, and I'm so happy because I just joined the DGA a while ago back, and, I, and some of the other DGA members were saying it's like their third film, and they have the same like nervousness on set, so I feel a little bit better. Yeah. But all the time, it's like you're just like totally worried about something or fretting over something else, but you have to pretend that everything's under control. You're absolutely confident because you're sort of, um, you know, managing the set in that way. And everybody's looking to you, like everything's going fine until they see you having any sort of doubt. Yeah. And so you sort of have to have that feel at all times. And it's like when I was in India, I was six months pregnant wow. and I didn't tell anybody. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it was for that reason. My my producer always gets mad at me. She's like, why didn't you tell me? And I'm like, because the dynamic would have changed where everybody's sort of like looking to me to see like, are you okay? Or like they're second, whatever it oh, is. And I was like, right. we can't have that because, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, so that was always there. Like always had to be like, even when you're not sure, just you just have this confidence. 
Well, I mean, now now that the the process is well, it's not over because you have to promote the movie now. But the the film is done. You, <laughs> can, you you have at least the distance from from being in the midst of, of shooting, and you know it's out there for the world to consume. How do you do? You feel like you measured up to the movie that you saw in your mind. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm ne- I'm never gonna think that. There, there's still things I look at where I'm like, I could have done this better. I could have done that better. I mean, I give myself some slack, and that's really just my friends making me feel better. And they're, they're like, oh, it's, you know, it's doing well, and you did the best you could. But for me, I'm just a typo. I'm always like, ah, you know, I wish I had done this better, or this part could have been way better. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, but I think I would have needed more time, and we had to shoot when we had to shoot because other investors otherwise um, wouldn't have made it happen. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and I mean, you know... Uh, I think George Lucas, and I'm sure he was quoting somebody, he says, he says you know, movies are never finished. They're just abandoned. <laughs> I like that. That makes sense. Yeah, well, and, and I think he used that yeah. as an excuse to keep not abandoning his movies, which is why he kept trying to... I was going to say, he, yeah. <laughs> he he kind of abused yeah, that he, notion, right? <laughs> but, but it, I mean, I think that goes to this broader conversation, which, you know, as as... A critic, I'm kind of like once the movie has been released, it doesn't belong to the filmmaker exclusively anymore. Now it's a there. There's joint custody um, with with the right, audience. Right. Yeah. You know, um, and and the, the, I, I think I think that uh, th- this is just the, a fascinating broader discussion of. Uh, you know the, the the experience that the the audience members have is unique and it's intrinsically linked with the film that they saw in the theater. So when it changes into something else, uh, it, it becomes delinked from that movie that people saw originally, you know? Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> I just echo what you said. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's it, the movies. I mean, it's like every stage of the process. Always the movie is always different. And then, you know, they're marking it in one way and it's actually one way. Although actually I think they did pretty well with ours in terms of kind of staying true to what it was but yeah. you know a lot of the times there's just different sectors dealing with each thing and you know they're not necessarily all working with one vision so i mean we, uh, yeah go ahead professor but, oh, i was just going to ask like then like as an artist uh, then i'm curious you know h- how you feel kind of being like okay well you know like like putting you know putting the basket in the river as it were you know and just allowing it to kind of flow and 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 just allowing other hands to 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 kind of take it from there uh and and also maybe to kind of reflecting on what Zucky said in terms of you know once the film is out and and it's out there for 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 audience consumption um it becomes this sort of joint uh joint custody of you know in terms of the like the the end content yeah, I mean, and that's, uh, I mean, to speak to the first thing, I'm dealing with that actually less with the movie and more in TV world. Because the movie, I've had more influence over it because, you know, I was one of the producers as well. But our, and our distributors have been fantastic. They have had more of a single vision and they've really stayed true to it and kind of what we wanted. But um, in TV world, I mean, that's completely opposite. It's, it's very much like you come up with an idea, you create the show, and like you have a certain hand in it, but you're not a veteran showrunner. So it's like, do you want the show to go? And you're going to have to give up a little bit of that control and who knows how it's going to end up? Or do you just say no and you can't have anything? And I chose, you know, to sell the show and have it, have it happen. So, so now I'm just sort of like, wondering <laughs> you know with nervousness like okay what, what it'll happen? become yeah yeah but i mean and in terms of like you know the audience having what you were saying with the audience that's like you know that's that's how movies work and it's sort of like it's purposely for instance why um i didn't spell out the ending of the movie the way you know right. some of our um studios and things wanted like i know the audience is meant to have their own experience and i wanted to kind of give sort of i don't know like respect to that and to them as like that that story is as much their perception of it as you know what it was intended so you know never really answer that question of certain things that people um want to know and and people are fine with it and i think that's part of like the beauty of you know going to a theater and watching well and what it and i don't know if this was part of your your thought process but what that ending really evoked for me was goodwill hunting um yes that was absolutely the thought process <laughs> oh, okay so good okay so i'm, I'm yeah. on the same wave so so to, to me that's like as far as I'm concerned, I mean, Goodwill Hunting is is one of my all time favorite movies. So that is uh, the fact that it made me think of that is is meant as a, as a great compliment because uh, I I 
you know, because it's kind of the same thing, right? Where where we don't need to see what happens next. The the story continues beyond the edges of the film. We don't ever need to see it because we've still reached a conclusion. That's what uh, I got the same sense with this. Right. Yeah, and and I'm so happy because that's also one of my favorite movies. But yeah, I mean. You try, you're literally living with these characters and you want them to sort of, you know, live a little bit beyond the movie. And if you close it, then it's like the book is closed as opposed to kind of staying with people while they're, you know, with their friends for those like two minutes or whatever after they leave a movie and then talking about it. Right. You know, it's funny. We were talking about Goodwill Hunting. I, I screened that film in, in my classes and it's finally happened where I'm like, oh, we're about to watch Goodwill Hunting. Anybody here seen it? And nobody's, forget seen it. Nobody's even heard <gasps> of it. Heard of it. That's so wrong. Isn't that sad? <laughs> And and that it occurs really to me, sad. it's You're well when you think about old. it though, it's a twenty year old movie, and for if you're like a a college freshman right now, Matt Damon right now is like an older actor. <laughs> Insane. Isn't thanks, that crazy? thanks for making me feel so old. I saw that when I was little, but I felt like I saw it when I was older. But yeah, I don't. Oh well, okay. I just I'll just feel old now. Thanks. It's, it's exact. I think it's twenty years old, like this fall, right now. So. It's old. <laughs> Wow. Soon there are going to be people who don't know who Robin Williams is. Actually, it's, that might be the case now. It's it's getting there. I mean, I mean the idea that like if you if you haven't seen Goodwill Hunting, I think that's that's entirely you know within the realm of the possibility. But the fact that they haven't even heard of it, I was like, oh god, ugh. And I need to lie down in the corner, you know. <laughs> Curl up. <laughs> what can you do? But I mean, I we sound I, like such old people right now. I, like, I, Them I, little kids in their Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but I mean, I, I I think I think of that of specifically of Goodwill Hunting as that example of like scrappy young creatives who get their movie out there. And I think I think yeah. when when you look at I mean that movie wouldn't have gotten made if Kevin Smith hadn't happened to take a look at the script and and really push it. And so the fact that uh, with with this movie, I mean, it to me that's what's so fascinating to me is it's an entirely new paradigm where now we're at a point. Where we can we can uh, get you know people in the in the, the the potential audience to kick in enough movie to to get this thing going enough money excuse me to get this thing going I mean that's that's amazing to me you know it's like the new frontier yeah I mean for sure I mean you you can you you don't even need as many resources now to shoot a movie I mean I think before this movie would have even cost us a lot more you know, than it did. Uh, and, you, you know, they have, you have Tangerine that was shot on an iPhone and all that stuff. Right, so, right. Um, things are possible, but, I mean, you do need, like, what you need is sort of that large, large network of support, whether it's people who are literally working for, for free or, you know, mm. small amount on your set and working on weekends or, you know, even on this where you saw, like, sort of the community and social media support and things. So it's like you don't need funds, but you do need... Um, you do need people. Like, there's people who root for the project, and that's really what makes them go somewhere. Like, even or like the Kevin Smith, you know, of before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I think that with with this film, and and I, I have no doubt that it, it's it's going to be extremely well received. It already is. Uh, I think a lot of young people, especially in the Muslim community, will be looking to you, and and not only viewing you as as a role model, but also coming to you for advice. So, with that in mind, right now. Uh, what advice would you give to young people who are wanting to break into this arena? How do you uh, how do you sort of keep your your compass straight while while doing something that you feel passionately about? Yeah, um, I mean, just given what little experience I've had, I mean, I think the main things. I mean, there's the practical things, which is like find a mentor. I think that's invaluable. Someone who really kind of. Um, lends the weight of their experience, um, obviously get really good, good at what you do. And I say that, like, that sounds natural, mm -hmm. but I think one problem we have in a lot of communities, and especially in the Muslim community, is people do a lot of multimedia content, and, and it reaches this version of Muslim good. Hmm. It's not necessarily everybody good, but it's Muslim good. And then the Muslim <laughs> artist is okay with that. And then That's when they so try true. to compete in like the world, yeah. they're just like, but they're like, but everybody loved my skit or whatever. And I was like, no, no. Find some non-Muslims. You must have some non-Muslim friends. Like, send it to festivals. Send it to people. Like, go <laughs> hashtag, out in the hashtag world. Hashtag Muslim and... good. I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's sort of like, you know how there's, like, restaurants where they're like, hey, that's like, oh, you know, are those good burgers? Oh, they're Muslim good. Yeah, it's like that, like, <laughs> with, with Muslim artists. And so, like, that's, like, the I've biggest thing. I've never heard like, that, but that's perfect. Just general good. Yeah, I've never yeah, heard that, Yeah, and so, that's I mean, brilliant. I think those are the things, and it's, like, very much, um, yeah, um, get I a mentor. It. 
become good and not Muslim good and like, you know, just work really, really hard and try to have integrity in everything you do. Because I found like when the decisions we made that didn't compromise things later on, we're getting the reward of it, even though they're really hard at the time. And so I really believe in that, like work with good people work with integrity and don't like, because there's so many things when you're, you're, you're doing the scrappy, you know, creative thing, yeah. you're really trying to get your project out there. There's so there, there, it doesn't sound like, but there's so many opportunities where you just tiny little ways that you could sell your soul because you feel like, Oh, but I need this to get ahead. Um, and you can't do that. It, it, it's, it's, it's going to bite you in the end. And when you don't, there's people who will kind of reward you for it later and, and the project. Well, hey, Zucky, I, I propose we change the name of our podcast to Not Just Muslim Good. Not because to, that, that should be the <laughs> subtitle. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, you and I have had these same conversations around, you know, <laughs> even not only, you know, when we first started off the podcast, but just continue to have, which is to, you know, to, to increase the level of quality or whatever it is, uh, just because, we, you know, we, we don't want to be in that echo chamber of just Muslim good. Um, you know, we want we want to be able to produce content that is, you know, um, that is uh, engaging to all audiences. So that's just and this interview today. There you go. There you go. Oh, really? <laughs> nice. Sure, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're not just saying that, um, <laughs> but uh, but but Lena, I, I guess, I, and as, as Zucky, unless you had another question, I, I you know, I, I kind of wanted to allow Lena the opportunity to kind of maybe talk about projects that I know you know you, you just finished that and was sold. That's my next question. So show. there you go. There you go. Again, <laughs> another proof of how we finish each other's thoughts. Um, <laughs> but um, it, they're like perhaps I don't know how much you can tell us about the TV show or any other exciting projects that you're working on right now. Um, I am working on the TV show. I'm not allowed to say much about, <laughs> except the fact that it's a half hour single camera comedy. Um, I actually don't think I can say much more than that. Um, I'm working on another TV show that, um, I'm developing with the, one of the executives of, um, one of these network comedies here. And it's, um, I don't know that I can say much about that one either. It's, that was about, um, a wedding planner and her group of useless friends and they have a company. Um, I don't know that I can say much more than that. And that doesn't mean it seem to like make it very exciting, but I can't really give away the rest. Um, and what I, I can say something that I have a movie that I'm working on. Um, and they hired a magnificent writer for me, um, uh, a, a small company that's come on board and it's my story and he's writing it. Um, he's like extremely well-known writer and, and it's about a, it's very tonally like the tiger hunter. It's a comedy drama, which um, I say on purpose because it's a movie about a magician who, at the height of his career, goes on um, a show like The Tonight Show, mm-hmm. and he accidentally impales a volunteer's hand on live television. And <laughs> oh from God. there, his career is over, and he develops chronic depression. But it's, it's slightly comedic, too. So it's like, you know, he thinks his bunny hates him and stuff like that. And so that many years later, there's a magic competition where basically he tries to get his mojo back and a lot of other stuff. So that's sort of my passion project of the moment. And then, you know, I'm getting into TV episodic directing right now, too, so... Well, all, all of that, wow. the, all the stuff that you can't tell us right now, I hope all that means is that you'll come back later when you can tell us about it <laughs> I would and, love to. <laughs> and, and share, share another conversation with us. So, so uh, the Tiger Hunter is in theaters right now. Uh, folks, seek it out. I, I, I just watched it this morning and I, and I truly enjoyed it. And I, I'm very hopeful that a, a wide enough audience will see this, that uh, it'll, it'll really, uh, you know, have the same kind of impact that Goodwill Hunting did. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, and we're really yeah. hoping people go out this weekend. TheTigerHunter.com is where you can get the screening and theater information. I have to say that. Um, in case, uh, Especially the Muslim community. They're very confused. Um, <laughs> it, it, they, they have trouble seeing movies. Um, so really have had to you know, spell things out. They've been really supportive, but um, not that good at using things like Fandango. So, yes, TheTigerHunter.com. Well, uh, Alina, thank you so much. And, and I know that you are a presence on social media. Is there anywhere online that you, if people want to seek, seek you out, they can find you? Um, Facebook, I guess, is best. Yeah. Facebook is also contact form on my website. There you go. Perfect. Uh, Great. Well, well, I, I really feel privileged because I, I feel like we, like we got Lena when she was just accessible enough where we could just reach out to her directly and ping her. And whereas I think in the future now we're going to have to like have our people contact her people, and we don't have people. So kind of, <laughs> I don't know about that. Perviz yeah. is my people. I'm <laughs> his you people. You guys are so. contactable than I am. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Well, well, uh, Lena, thank you so much for coming on, and we wish you nothing but success with the film and everything you have coming up in the future. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And before we wrap things up, Pervez, why don't you tell the audience uh, where they can find us? 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, please email comments, feedback, your thoughts, uh, your suggestions to diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can also hit us up on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. Um, I am available personally uh, to reach out to as well on whether it's Facebook or on Twitter. My handle there is uh, at Pervez F, as in Frank Ahmed. So drop me a line. Drop me or what is it? DM me or tweet me, whatever. There you go. Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> Grandpa, I know, right? Uh, send me send me a letter at Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay and what about you Zeki? where can people find you I know uh, you're way more of a social media presence than I am well you can find me at my website that's uh, zekiscorner.com z-a-k-i-s corner that's also my twitter minus the dot com also my instagram and uh, you can uh, find me on facebook as well and uh, if you have any questions for us please send them your way I know we've gotten a, a couple pieces of feedback Pervez any, anything you want to share with us while we have you uh, no, I, I, you know, I, I know you and I kind of shared uh, an email that we received, and I did want to kind of uh, read that on, on the air and, and respond to it. Yeah, so uh, we got one from uh, Idris Watts, who emailed us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com, so I'll go ahead and share this. Uh, Dear Zaki and Pervez, I pray you are both well. I've done it. I listened to all your 52 podcasts in 48 days, and it has been a big eye-opener. Oh my gosh, I'm afraid to find out what his eyes were open to. I haven't even listened to our, our podcasts. Forget 48 days. I haven't listened to them at all. So this is, this is, that's, that's, that's brave. Uh, I felt listening to these conversations has expanded my consciousness and increased my understanding to the needs of my own community here in the United Kingdom. May Allah bless you both. I've also learned a whole load of new words to add to my vernacular. Segway, milieu, camelback, piggyback, unpack. Quote, I think that's a good place to finish off. Hermeneutics, hiatus. Well, I look at that list and I'm like, at least one of those words is definitely not from me. <laughs> Camelback, right? Uh, well, her hermeneutics. <laughs> I know, I'm kidding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I loved Kamran Pasha's passion, Abdul Qadir Lamin's historical insights, Mark Gonzalez's spiritual insights, Mustafa Davis's genuineness, and Uzzer's second interview was raw and cutting, but much needed. Yeah, I agree with that. That was awesome. And mm -hmm. it is lovely to meet a fellow Muslim geek. Before I became Muslim, I had a massive collection of comic books that were sleeved with backing boards, and I had every appearance of Swamp Thing going back to the 70s, as well as loads from the Vertigo series such as Sandman. Those are both great runs, by the way. Uh, however, I gave them all away on becoming Muslim to one of my best friends. Zucky's conversations gave me true nostalgia about those days. Also, Zucky's voice seems to change depending on the setting. It is really weird. Well, let me explain that, Idris. See, I, uh, I was going to say, like, my, my level of maturity is, it, is it dictates how high-pitched my voice gets. So I, I go no. through, I go through Bobby Brady syndrome. Bobby Brady. Now there's a call. But that, I think there's. I think that's a callback that callback that uh, Idris will also appreciate. Yeah. And we'll find out. Uh, anyway, thanks for all your efforts and may Allah bless the both of you. Thank you so much and all your loved ones and families. May your voices reach out and change the current image that is portrayed as Islam within and without the Muslim community for the better. And may we all be of service to expanding the consciousness of the communities toward a closer relationship with the divine and ourselves. Uh, well, well amen you. to that. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I want to thank, uh, uh, you know, uh, C.D. Idris, uh, you know, and I say that because uh, having kind of looked him up online after we got the email, uh, he himself is a teacher, a content provider out in the United Kingdom, uh, certainly uh, a learned scholar. Um, and so we're, we're really honored when we get feedback, uh, feedback in general, but feedback from someone who is as imminent as, um, you know, Sheikh Adri. So thank you so much for listening and for uh, checking out the show. And uh, it's, like I said, your, your feedback meant a lot. Uh, that's what I had to say, Zaki, how about you? Yeah, I, I sincerely appreciate any any co uh, comments that we get, much less one that's so in-depth and uh, from someone who clearly dove deep into the catalog. So that's, uh, the, you know, uh, the fact that we have enough episodes to binge listen is, I think, pretty cool. <laughs> You know? That is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And it's a daunting task because I know some of our episodes tend to be slightly heavier and uh, a little bit more, you know, just and intense than others. And my voice changes from episode to episode. So it's <laughs> yeah, that keeps it exciting. Yeah. That keeps it exciting and intriguing. So uh, thank you so much for all the feedback. And uh, please, if you, if you haven't already, uh, you know, leave us a star rating, uh, leave us a review on iTunes 
um, and uh, it, it, it does mean a lot to us, and uh, it just allows us to, you know, um, not only get that feedback, but you know, um, increase, I guess, the level of uh, of, uh, of visibility that we have with regards to our little humble show here. There we go. And with that, uh, this has been Diffuse Congruence. We thank you for listening, and we hope you'll join us next time. 